everybody, welcome back to Vegas Tips and Tricks for a Saturday, May 23rd, 2020. We're back with a regular program today, including the return of the super popular Cocktail of the Week with our friend PJ coming up on the show today. Uh, one quick announcement, uh, we are planning to do a live stream this Wednesday night as our sort of monthly live stream or every four week live stream. So uh, I'll post a link to that at some point, but uh, just uh, be around about uh, 6 o'clock Vegas time, 8 o'clock here in the central time zone, and 9 o'clock uh, in the east. Or if you want to stay up really late, I guess, uh, I don't know, 2 o'clock in London, you know, hey, be free, free to join us. High levels of inebriation are encouraged, but uh, that'll be coming up this Wednesday, uh, unless there's some announcement otherwise. We're going to try to squeeze it in between all the other live streams. This has been a pretty exciting or uh, certainly newsworthy week in Las Vegas, so let's get started on our Vegas news story of the week. And of course, the news story of the week is reopening Vegas, question mark? It sounds like it could be happening. Just yesterday afternoon, there was an announcement and a um, document that was published uh, from the governor that suggested that on Tuesday, May 26th, when he holds another uh, briefing on this matter, that he would suggest that casinos be allowed to reopen on June the 4th. Um, that would be pretty early. That would be uh, earlier than I expected. Um, so let's uh, sort of diagnose what that means here on the surface. First of all, by, by all accounts, this is a legitimate news story. Sources seem good. It's been reported by all of the major outlets, not just guy, some guy named Jared or something on his Twitter feed. So it looks to be legit. Um, of course, all of this is subject to change. Uh, one of the reasons why we've seen this acceleration in the phases of uh, reopening in Nevada. It's because we've seen a pretty consistent downturn in cases, hospitalizations, etc. If that were to change over the next several days, I would expect that the governor's response would change as well. So hopefully that will not be the case, but everything is subject to anything new that uh, comes on the scene as far as the virus, its spread, and how well contained it is. Third, the governor's uh, approval does not mean that all the casinos can just fling open their doors and start doing business. Uh, the casino reopenings have to be cleared with the Nevada Gaming Commission. Um, now, I suspect, in fact, I'm sure that in order to reopen, the Gaming Commission has required these casinos to uh, post a plan for how they are going to reopen and what steps they're going to take to contain the spread of the virus and protect their employees and their customers. I would also suspect that uh, these plans are basically filed, or at least ready to be filed. So once the governor gives the okay, uh, it should be a formality in terms of submitting the plans, how long it will take for the gaming commission to say, okay, you can open. I don't know. That's, that, that may cause a delay of some sort. And, you know, you're going to have to basically have a plan for every casino. It doesn't matter if M Life owns 10 properties. Uh, they're opening 10 different casinos that each operate under a different casino license. So uh, that could cause a delay as well. And then there's simply the delay in actually getting the properties open. And while uh, all of the hotels have been talking about reopening now for well over a month, and have talked, you know, consistently said, okay, this is where we're going to reopen. This is when we're going to start taking reservations again. This is our plan that we're putting into place. Um, actually doing it uh, could take additional time as well. So June 4th is still a very optimistic number. That's a couple of weeks off. Um, but if that does come to pass, then we will definitely see casinos operating in Las Vegas, I would say by the latest at mid-June. Now, what casinos will be operating? We learned a little bit more about this week because we finally got a, an indication from Caesars what officially, excuse me, would be their first two property reopenings 
And it's been reported prior to this, but they will initially open Caesar's Palace and Flamingo. One obviously a more upscale property, the other obviously a budget property. Uh, they also point out that after that, if demand is suitable, they would open up Harrah's, uh, as well as the Link Promenade is what I believe I heard. So I don't know if the Link itself would open in that second phase, but the Link Promenade would, I assume giving potentially giving access to the High Roller, but also all of the restaurants and bars along that path. So uh, the other properties obviously would, fo would, uh, would follow that. It is curious that some of those properties are among those that are rumored to be uh, for sale or at least available to the right bidders. So we will see. Uh, on the M Life MGM front, more confirmation that the first two properties to open would be Bellagio in New York, New York. But now it appears MGM will closely follow behind that. And that very extended time frame that we saw leaked a couple of weeks ago, which showed places like Aria and Mirage not opening until well into 2021, um, that would appear to have been just sort of a working document or a proposal or sort of a worst case scenario as now they're talking about a much more compressed time frame. You can actually still book rooms at these other properties starting in July. And while that may be optimistic, uh, it now seems much more likely, um, if the demand is there, that we would see some of those properties coming online in just a few months. And one would assume probably something very similar going on at Caesars. Um, the uh, Win has announced that... Uh, due to some loopholes in the existing uh, rules, uh, they will actually be opening up a few of their restaurants uh, this following Friday, um, as casino restaurants are allowed to open if they meet certain qualifications. I have not heard of any other properties doing this, uh, though there are uh, you know, restaurants along the Las Vegas Strip which are now open, as well as several downtown. Uh, we don't know that much yet about the downtown properties. Um, the all indications are that uh, the Derek Stevens properties, the D and Golden Gate, will be online very soon. Uh, also, the Plaza, El Cortez, uh, the Boyd properties are still somewhat in limbo as they've decided to focus in on their locals casinos first. Um, Win is likely to be out the gate as soon as possible. They probably prepared as well and have been working towards this reopening as long as anyone. And I suspect you'll also see uh, Venetian come online very soon. We will not likely see any buffets anytime in the near future. And what a retooled, rebooted buffet might look like remains to be seen. Um, there is apparently a good deal of work being done on Bacchanal to try to remodel, refurbish that in order to uh, better meet the current health standards. And those we would expect going forward, Treasure Island announced officially their buffet is going away and not coming back. Um, I, I did not, uh, I, there were a couple of announcements about uh, businesses in Las Vegas that aren't coming back, but we've certainly seen some indication that uh, a number of corporations, companies, uh, outside of Las Vegas uh, simply aren't going to survive this shutdown. So it wouldn't be surprising if some places in Las Vegas also did not, though I wouldn't expect that to be any of the major casinos. The Pepper Mill opened up this past week. This is good news for people seeking fun diners with huge portions. Uh, the Neon Museum opened up, uh, I believe, yesterday. And we're likely to see the Mob Museum opening up next Friday. Uh, Container Park had already been open outside of the bars. So we'll see how that progresses. Um, some properties are talking about doing some sort of shows. Uh, that seems much more problematic. And we saw this past week, uh, one of the last major residencies for the year, the Scorpions canceled um, their residency, um, you know, Going forward, Morrissey canceled uh, some shows at Caesars Palace. So the show business is not looking good. Obviously, the sort of pool party, uh, day clubs, nightclub business still very shaky. 
So we'll have to see going forward. But obviously a lot of news this week, and we'll uh, keep you up to date uh, next week on any additional reopening plan. Okay, by popular demand, he's back. Not his evil cousin JP, but PJ himself is back with another one of his specialty cocktails. I think you're going to really enjoy this one, so uh, take it away, PJ. I think I'm pointing the right way. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Cocktail of the Week with your host and not a professional bartender, PJ. Hey, John. Thanks for that fabulous introduction. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the episode of Cocktails of the Week. Today's segment is going to be a little bit of Las Vegas. I know we're all missing out on Las Vegas. Or maybe by the time this airs, maybe we're all going back to Las Vegas. I'm not sure. I just present the uh, drinks to John and he puts them out when he sees fit. So today's drink is called the Monkey Shine Cocktail. And the Monkey Shine Cocktail originated from the stories that I've heard from the Bellagio Casino in Las Vegas. And uh, to tie in with that, I've got my White Castle Las Vegas shirt on. Uh, the uh, Monkey Shine is in a uh, martini glass or a similar glass to that. I don't have the uh, proper glass for it, but we're going to make ours in a martini glass. Uh, excuse me. And um, first thing we're going to do with our martini glass is we're going to coat it with sugar cinnamon. Sugar cinnamon, yes indeed. This is a three, co this is a three spirit drink. Uh, white rum, uh, Malibu rum, and uh, pineapple juice. We're going to put all that in our shaker, shake it up pretty good, pour it in this glass, and then put it in this belly. So stay tuned everybody, we'll be right back with the Monkey Shine Cocktail. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. First thing we want to do is put in a couple of our perfectly squared ice cubes into our shaker. And we'll drop in one more. We're going to put one in our martini glass just to keep that chilled while we're making this drink. Okay, first thing we're going to do is two ounces of uh, white rum. With our precision pours, two ounces, one ounce of <laughs> Malibu rum. <laughs> I love these things. These are great. These are great. I don't have one on my pineapple juice, but you want to shake that up. You might notice your Route 66 bottle. I got these at the Route 66 Casino in uh, New Mexico, just outside of Albuquerque. If you ever get a chance, uh, stop by there. It's a great casino. And we're doing a one ounce. This is not a perfect pour. But that was a good pour. <laughs> All right. Put our lid on in to commence the shake of this puppy up, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, this is called the Monkey Shine. It was created in the Bellagio. Now, this recipe might be a little different. Because I saw a lot of different uh, recipes for uh, this drink, but this one uh, looked pretty good. One I saw from one of the guys that I like to follow. Anyhow, let's, um, let's take that puppy out. And let's get to, ooh, baby. Alrighty, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you That looks good That looks very good. No garnish on this one because we've got the rim with the cinnamon sugar Ladies and gentlemen, let me present to you the monkey shine! How does that look? Pretty good, pretty good indeed. Alrighty, now the moment we've all been waiting for. Okay, welcome back. 
Now the moment we've all been waiting for, the taste. Cheers, everybody. Man, there is nothing like a nice chilled cocktail. And uh, Malibu rum, pineapple juice, what a great mixture. Love them both, love them both. White rum just adds a little bit more kick to it. Punch, kick, bite, whatever you want to call it. But ladies and gentlemen, next time you're at the Bellagio or any casino in Las Vegas or locally, ask for the monkey shine. See if they make it the same way I just did. White rum, Malibu rum, pineapple juice, in a chilled glass, delicious. Now, ladies and gentlemen, back to John and tips and tricks. Tips and tricks? Vegas tips and tricks. <laughs> John, take it away. Oh, man. Thanks, PJ, for sharing another tasty beverage with us. Uh, next week, make sure you tune in. We've got a special guest mixologist. I think you're going to recognize him, so uh, you want to tune in for that. This week in Vegas history, we celebrate the 64th anniversary, the anniversary, the anniversary of the Fremont Hotel in downtown Las Vegas, which opened up May 18, 1956. Um, one of the oldest, most uh, venerable properties in the city. When it opened, it was the tallest hotel, not simply in Las Vegas, but in the state of Nevada. Uh, it was the first Las Vegas hotel to hold that distinction. Previously, they had all been in Reno. There's a little trivia for you. I didn't hold that title very long. The Dunes in 1961 would surpass it. Fremont's opened with about 130, 140 rooms. Uh, by 1963, it would build the existing, what is the existing tower, and expand to over 400 rooms. The Fremont has always been one of those mobbed up hotels, uh, never more so than in the mid 70s when it was taken over by Alan Glick's Argent Corporation. Uh, the story of that corporation as a front for organized crime is that which is told in the motion picture casino, while most of uh, the storyline revolves around what was essentially the stardust in reality. Uh, Glick and his front corporation also owned the Fremont as well as the Hacienda. Uh, eventually, as you no, the FBI kind of caught up with the skimming operations and the other illegal practices uh, connected to the Kansas City, Chicago, and Milwaukee mobs and uh, basically removed control of those properties. Um, and in 1983, uh, the Boyd Corporation, which previously had opened the Cal downtown as well as Sam's Town, named after its founder, Sam Boyd of Sam Boyd Stadium, uh, they began operating those properties, and in 1985, they purchased those properties, adding them to their hotel inventory uh, and giving them now a squeaky clean reputation. Uh, in the mid-2000s, the property was remodeled, and it is desperately in need of an additional remodel. Um, it is uh, one of the most crowded casinos I can imagine anywhere. Um, Anytime it's relatively busy. I mean, it's several excuse me's and bumping into people just to walk through the place. Uh, it, <laughs> it is not a property well suited to social distancing. And as I mentioned, is desperately in need of a remodel. I stayed there three separate times in the mid tens, I guess we'll say mid teens, um, including a stay of six consecutive nights. I, I don't know exactly what I was thinking there. I guess it was cheap, but, um, you know, it, it was adequate at that point, but the most recent room reviews and room tours I've seen there, including one by my friend uh, Anastas, uh, make sure you subscribe to Anastas 617, that's my plug of the day, uh, which suggests that the rooms are rapidly decaying. Now, I know this past year there had been a proposal floated uh, that at least reached uh, potentially the planning commission uh, that has now at least gone on the back burner, to build an additional hotel tower uh, on the east side of the property. 
And upon completion of that tower, they would shut down the original tower, more or less gut it, and turn the very small rooms there into essentially mini-suites. So that would certainly be welcome, and certainly a welcome addition in general to downtown, but I don't know how realistic that is going forward. Um, as a very loyal clientele, uh, it is a great location right there on the four corners with Golden Nugget, Binions, and Four Queens. Uh, of course, it can be a bit noisy. Um, I was fortunate enough to face away from the street when I stayed there, so not so bad. <clears throat> Notable for uh, Tony Roma's, that's exciting to you. Dunkin' Donuts, which is exciting to some of us. Um, no shows, no pool. It's just an old hardcore gambling joint. Um, whether it will reopen soon, nobody knows. It would seem like the boy property downtown that least relies on the Asian American business, the Hawaiian business. So it would seem like it would be the first of their three downtown properties to reopen. We shall see. Um, it is pretty convenient, uh, has very convenient access, obviously, to downtown, but also to the uh, um, the uh, Strip Express bus, which is literally right across the street. So that's the Fremont Hills Hotel, 64 years old, and uh, we'll have to see what the future brings for this property. Speaking of the Strip Express bus, as you know, we're counting down or counting up. There's no order to these. Uh, 10 of my all-time best Vegas tips or tricks, and today we're going to be talking about budget travel. Uh, you might call it extreme budget travel, except that's probably going to be people hitchhiking or walking out of the airport. There are YouTube videos. Check it out. But uh, if you're traveling on the cheap and want to save some money, the two express buses uh, that cater mostly to tourists are a great value. If you're at the airport, if you go down to level zero, you can pick up uh, a number of different uh, Las Vegas buses, but the one you want is the Wax Bus, the West Clef Airport Express, uh, which is currently not operating, but I'm sure it will again. And for $2, it'll take you downtown within a couple of blocks of your hotel, because everything downtown is within a couple of blocks of your hotel. It also does stop on the far south end of the Strip uh, between the Tropicana and MGM. So if you're staying at one of those properties, maybe a good deal there. But the great deal about it is it fairly limited stops, um, and it's $2. That's right, $2. And you can pick that bus back up at the bus stop right across from the Fremont, right next to the Binions, take you back to the airport for $2. And you're not going to do that in an Uber. You're not going to do that in a taxi. You're not going to do that even in one of those old-fashioned uh, shuttle bus things. Um, not the most glamorous thing, but these are fairly new buses. They're comfortable, air-conditioned, uh, lots of room, So, and they're not packed with locals traveling all over the place. So it's uh, a very convenient um very convenient way to get from the airport to downtown, certainly. In addition, you have the SDX bus, the Strip Express bus, which also picks up, uh, downtown anyway, picks up at that same bus stop. Now, it's not as ex inexpensive because it's considered a tourist route. So if you want a single ride, that'll cost you $6. That's not a great value. But if you want a 24-hour pass, that's only $8. And if you're going to be around for a few days, a three-day pass is $20. So... If you want to stay downtown, but you want to take some trips to the Strip and explore different areas there, uh, you can do so for 72 hours for 20 bucks, which uh, I don't have to tell you, that's one cab ride, which actually the cab ride will probably cost you more than that. So if you don't mind waiting around a little bit and enjoying some quality public transportation, then the Strip Express and the Wax Bus can save you a lot of money. Uh, in addition, if you be, buy one of those three-day passes, that's also good on any of the regular buses, like the Deuce, which runs up and down the Strip, uh, as well as any of the residential buses. So you could definitely do a lot of exploring at a very low price. That's our tip or trick for the day. And that's going to wrap up the show for today. A little bit longer again today. We had a little bit more to talk about, so I hope you enjoyed our program. As I say, this Wednesday, uh, 6 o'clock Vegas time, We'll be back with our monthly live stream, and we will be back again next week with another episode of Vegas Weekly. Until then, I hope you have a great, lucky, and healthy week. We will. See you soon.